may need a Bible as well, just raise your hand and uh, we'll make sure everyone gets to you. Just one long sentence of him going on and on about the blessings that we have in Christ. And we get this series title from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, where Paul says that the Father God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Right? He has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. And so that's what we're doing in this series. We're looking at the blessings we have in Christ. We want to know them, what they are. We want to understand them. And we want to praise God and thank God for them. Let them stir our hearts and change us. Amen? amen. Anybody else want that for you? I do too. So let's, let's give a hearty amen. So uh, now, um, uh, today, in that long, complex sentence that is verses 3 through 14, we're going to be uh, zoning in on, zeroing in on, maybe better, uh, through verses 5 through 8 of chapter 1 of Ephesians. Uh, so verses 5 through 8. And what we're going to see here is the blessing of adoption. That we are sons and daughters of God in Christ. And what I hope you'll see today is that we have been embraced by the Father in Christ. We have been accepted by the Father in Christ because of this blessing. So let's look at the passage today. So it's Chapter 1 of Ephesians, verses 5 through 8. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. So, a few things that I want to spend our time considering that will help illuminate for us this blessing of adoption that we have in Jesus Christ. And uh, those few things, I just want to kind of, three things that will help us help us uh, illuminate this blessing of adoption. Uh, and that's one, God's adopted orphans. 
We see God's adopted orphans here. We see God's adoption process here. And we see God's adopted children here. Okay, so we're going to go through each one of those. Hopefully, this will illuminate this blessing for you. So, first, I want to zero in on just this phrase in verse 5. It says, In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons. You know, what's kind of, uh, you know, uh, the, the backdrop of this is that obviously there is a need for us to be adopted. Did you kind of catch that? The fact that we would need to be adopted in the first place shows that we are not naturally the sons and daughters of God. We are not naturally the children of God. We actually have to be adopted. And so God had to actually put forth a plan even before the foundation of the world, as it said in the verse before this, verse 4, to make us his children. He had to put forth a plan of adoption. So, in case that isn't obvious to you, I mean, I wouldn't talk about adopting Rosemary. That would be a little odd of me to be talking about adopting Rosemary. She's already my child. She's been born into my family. I think you all know she's my daughter, right? Right? And so if I'm talking about adopting her, well, that's odd. So clearly, we are not naturally the children of God. Um, <clears throat> this is the natural state of humanity. That we are not his children, but how does scripture portray humanity as naturally born into this world? It portrays us as the enemies of God. Not his children, but enemies. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 10. He calls us the enemies of God. In Romans chapter 8, he says we are hostile to God. In Ephesians chapter 2, he says we are dead in sins and trespasses, following the course of this world, not the way of heaven, following the power of the prince of the air that is now working the sons of disobedience, following Satan's ways and not following God. Through and through, it depicts us as, in, as his enemies. In fact, that's one problem that a lot of people have with the Bible, actually, is that it depicts humanity as the enemies of God, <laughs> right? And they say, well, how can God be so loving? Clearly, he's dead set against humanity. Look at what your own Bible says. And to that, we have to say, that's true. Naturally, we are the enemies of God. In fact, Paul says in the same letter, just a chapter later, chapter 2, verse 3, he says that we were by nature children of wrath. That's chapter 2, verse 3 of this book. We were by nature, by our very nature, who we intrinsically were, children of wrath, and not children of God. What does it mean to be a child of wrath? Well, if you're a child of God, well, you're not under his wrath. In fact, you could be called a child of love, a child of mercy. In fact, the scripture calls the adopted children of God the beloved, right? So clearly we have a very big difference here. How are we children of wrath naturally? Well, it's because we're not simply orphans, right? That's what I wanted to see here is that God has adopted orphans, but we're not simply, no one is truly a orphan in the sense of you were not born into a family. You know what I mean? Like everyone, including orphans, is born into a family, right? Even if we don't know our children or, or our parents or we're disconnected from them, we are all born into a family and we carry the characteristics and traits of our family, do we not? And of our parents. And we have all in this human race, been born into the same family, the family of Adam. And so we carry the characteristics of our father, Adam. And what was Adam? He was a rebel. He rebelled against God's law. Do not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in that day you shall surely die. You shall surely die. But what does the scripture say? The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Why is it death? Is it just some disconnected thing that says, well, just death happens when you sin? No, it's because we incur the wrath of a holy and just God. Do you ever feel a sense of justice in you that's offended when you see something evil happen? 
Now magnify that by infinity. And that's what God feels toward our sin. That's what God feels toward the family of Adam for our trespasses and sin and just our natural association. We are like Adam, a sinner, incurring the wrath of God, incurring the punishment, the just penalty of sin, which is death, eternal separation from a holy and just God. So we're enemies of God, we're children of wrath, but Paul also says, in, again in chapter 2, he says that we are strangers and aliens. He says that in chapter 2, verse 19, he calls us strangers and aliens. He says that in chapter 2, verse 19, but you can look back in chapter 2, verse 12, and he describes humanity as separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. Separated from Christ. Alienated. This is pretty alienating language, isn't it? Right? Uh, because literally it's calling us foreigners to God's kingdom. Right? When it says the commonwealth of Israel, we're not just talking about the nation of Israel. We're talking about the kingdom of God. We're talking about the kingdom of heaven. We're talking about the citizenry of the saints of God's kingdom, and all the blessings that are associated with being a citizen of God's kingdom. And what he's saying there is that we are aliens of that kingdom. We're foreigners of that kingdom. You don't get the rights of being a member of God's kingdom just naturally because you have not been born into that kingdom. You've been born into another kingdom. The scripture says that after we become Christians, after we call upon the name of the Lord for salvation, he transfers us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son, the kingdom of Jesus Christ. But until then, we are part of a different kingdom, the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of Adam, the kingdom of a rebel, on our way to death by the wrath of a holy and just God. So this is the picture of what it means to not be a child of God. This is the natural state of humanity, and this is why we needed adoption because we were rejected by the Father because of sin, unacceptable due to trespasses and a corrupt nature. But here's kind of the hope that we already begin to see here. Even then, even when we were children of wrath, even when we were enemies of God, even when we were strangers and aliens of God's kingdom, of his household, of his family, God had a plan. And in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons. Even when I was an enemy of God, even when I was a rebel against his will and his ways. Even when I did not deserve his love and any of his blessings, God's mind was already set and he had already determined that he would take me, he would take you, and he would make you his son and his daughter. Taken from being a rebel from being an enemy to be adopted into God's own family? What kind of God is this? How great is his mercy? How great is his grace? Does that not inflame your heart with worship and praise to this God? The fact that he would take rebels to his kingdom, strangers, aliens, and he would adopt them into his family. That is the grace of God on display and adoption. That is why this is such a blessing. That is why Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And this is just one of the ones he's talking about. So many blessings we have in Christ. Blessed in Christ. Even then, God had a plan for us. He had predetermined to make us acceptable in Christ as his very own children. Even when we were living in sin, even when we were doing the worst things that you can remember that we have done, even when we had the worst thoughts, 
even the worst desires, and we're living in the depths of sin, even then, God loved us and had planned for us to be his very children. And he didn't forget that plan just because we were enemies. That is the grace of God. So, what we see here is God's adopted orphans and he has a plan for us to adopt us as his own, his church. And we also see in this passage God's adoption process, how it is that he brings us to be his children. Look again at our verse. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. How can we possibly be adopted into God's family when we are enemies of God? I mean, this is really the question we should be asking. Most people assume on and presume on God's grace and mercy. They say, oh, God's gracious, he's merciful. He'll get me there. He'll get me to heaven someday. I don't really need to worry about it. But that's not really the way we should be thinking. It's more like, how on earth could anyone ever be taken into the holy presence of God? Because our sin was so outrageous to God. Such an abomination. I mean, have you read the Bible? It just portrays it as abomination to God. Filthy and disgusting to Him. How could any of us even be before His presence, let alone be adopted into His family? How can he do this? It would take a miracle, wouldn't it? Well, praise God, our God is a miracle worker, and he had a plan for doing just that. He had a plan, and it was only possible through Jesus Christ. The fact is, before we could be adopted into God's family, before that could ever happen, we needed forgiveness. And we needed cleansing of sin. We needed a real forgiveness. We, needed, we had a real debt that needed to be paid for. We had incurred a fine, and someone had to pay for it. We couldn't just simply be adopted into God's family because he said, Oh, you know what? I'm going to adopt you into my family. I'll adopt you into my family. No. A real thing had to happen. A real payment had to be paid. And that was through Jesus Christ. And that's why, in our passage, in verse 7, what does he say? In him, in Jesus Christ, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. There it is. We have been redeemed. Do you know what the word redemption means, right? To redeem something, to purchase something, to buy back something. We have been redeemed through what? Through what costly means? How, how much money could you amass to pay off this debt? There is no money that could be paid for it. It took the eternal son of God's own blood, his own death, to pay that penalty. It took his own divine blood to cleanse us of our sins and to secure us real and true forgiveness. And he did it. Praise God. Praise God. That shows us the riches of his grace when he would forgive us of all the ways we have trespassed against his holy, just, good law. That is the God we serve. That is the Father God who has planned to adopt us. But we don't only see this. You know, it, it says in our passage that it was through Jesus Christ and we saw just in the context there that here's one of the ways through Jesus Christ. It was through the redemption that he did, through his, the shedding of his blood, right? But there's a lot more contained in that. There's a lot more that Christ has to do for us in order to make us presentable, to make us adopted. And that's why it's not just through the person and work of Jesus Christ, but it's also through the person and work of the Holy Spirit. The person of the, and work of the Holy Spirit that Jesus gives us because of what he did on the cross. It is through the rebirth by the Holy Spirit. 
You know, that's the beautiful thing about this adoption that we have in Christ. You know, we, we get this picture of adoption in the scripture, but we also have this picture of rebirth. And the two aren't different. They're describing the same thing. Rebirth. You know, it's not as simple as God. You know, God couldn't just take you and adopt you into his family as you were. No, you had to die. You had to die with Christ on the cross. You had to die to your sin. You had to die to your old ways. You had to be buried and put in a grave. And you had to be raised up again by the power of God. You had to be reformed. Amen. Yeah. So when you're adopted into the family of God, you're not just simply transferred and some legal documents are being written out, right? You're being born again. You are actually born into the family of God. Because think about it. It would be strange. What it, it would kind of sound like, well, am I not still a child of Adam? Don't I still look like my dad, Adam? Am I not still a child of this system, of the world, of the Satan's kingdom? How can he just take me into his family? Don't I just look the same? No, because you have died with Christ. What does Galatians say? I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives within me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We needed to be reborn, born into the family of God, to not just be adopted children, but to become truly the natural children of the Almighty God. And that's what we are, truly children of God, because we have been born again by the Spirit, regenerated by the Spirit, that's exactly what Jesus says. You cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you are born again. Born again through water and through blood. Born again through the washing of the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. That is how we are adopted into the family of God. But how else? What, what else? It, it, notice that I'm kind of setting up a, a Trinitarian view of our salvation. When you think about it, I just talked about the work of the Son. I didn't even mean to do it. But we're talking about the work of the Son, the personal work of the Son that's necessary for our adoption, to be redeemed and purchased by His blood. We're talking about the personal work of the Holy Spirit, that we need to be born again through His regeneration, regenerative work on us. But there's also the personal work of the Father. And what does the Scripture say? Predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. It was according to the will of the Father that we should be adopted. It's according to his purposes and his plans that we should be taken into his family. And what a good truth that is. What a good truth that is, because kind of the concern is what if he changes his mind? What if he changes his will? Can he change his will and, and unadopt me, take me out of his family, kick me out? That's not how God works. You know, I, I think of that because um, we recently met a family in a trip that we went in to North Carolina. Um, this family had a, went through this whole adoption process, had jumped through all the hoops, and there was a, a little baby that was going to be born, and the mother didn't want to keep the baby, and so had put up the baby for adoption. So they went through all this process to get that baby, and finally the baby was born, and they took that baby and they loved that baby, they took that baby as their own. But then two weeks later, the mother changed her mind. And they had to give the baby back. And there was nothing they could do about it. Their will wasn't strong enough. There was no, nothing they could do against the state. It was the law of the state. The mother could change her mind within a certain amount of time. And there's nothing they could do about it. Is that how God's power works? No. Because he had planned for us before the foundation of the world that we should come to be his children. His will is not so easily changed. It's been predetermined before the foundation of the world. He will bring us to be his children. That's part of his adoption process, that he is willing for us to be his children. But we also see, though, that this isn't just the work solely of God, and somehow we just, oh, against my will, I'm here I am, a child of God. No, we also see that in the scripture, that this is through faith, through faith in Jesus Christ. 
This adoption process is accessed by faith alone. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 says this. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Through faith. John 1.12 says it even more clearly. But to all who did receive him, who received Jesus Christ, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. To all who receive him, to all who believe in the name of Jesus Christ, to those people he has promised us that we can receive this right from his very hand to become his children. So it's by faith. So what you see in all this is, in this adoption process, that you have been embraced by the Father through Jesus Christ. It's only in Christ's work for you that you can be forgiven and redeemed. It's only through the person and work of the Holy Spirit that you can be born again into his family. And it's only according with the Father's will and only by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, if you've been a Christian long enough, maybe you're familiar with some of this adoption process, some of the things that I've said. Um, but what is equally important to know are the effects of our adoption by God and how that changes everything, right? And I'm not going to go be able to get into all the effects of adoption because uh, there's a lot actually there. The more I thought about this as I was preparing the sermon. Um, but there's just some... That, I, that we should get into right now. But the rest will be unfolded later in this letter, and he's going to be talking about more. So we'll be getting into a lot more of that later uh, in this series. But I just want you to know, uh, to start thinking about the immediate effects of adoption and some of the things that you can already start thinking about, of what it means to be God's adopted children. So, I mean, first of all, just look at the text. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself. As sons. As sons. Sons and daughters. What we see there is that we have a new identity. Right? As we've been talking about, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 says this. So that you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. If members of his household, then his very children. We have a new identity. And that is what we are to live in. I am a son of God. I can call him my very own father. A son and daughter of the Most High God. Not only do we have a new identity, we have a new model. Our new identity as sons and daughters, it will affect our conduct. It will affect our lifestyle. It will affect our walk, what we do. We will behave like our Father. This is what it means to be born again after the image of our Father, after the image of Jesus Christ. This is what Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 says, right? This very same book, a few chapters later, he exhorts us because of these truths. Therefore, be imitators of God as Beloved children. Do you hear those words? Be imitators of God as beloved children. First of all, you might say, imitate God? What? That sounds like a big and high task. Yeah, it is. That's your dad. That's your new dad. You've got a new, high, wonderful task. You're imitating not your, you know, father on this earth who's pretty weak and fails a lot of ways. You're imitating your heavenly father. But notice what he says. Be imitators of God as beloved children. Notice the way in which we are to imitate our father and be like him. It's as beloved children. As children who are loved by God and who want to imitate our father because he's so loving to us. And children who love our father because he has blessed us so much. We want to imitate him. It's the part of a child that says, I want to be just like dad. Right? I want to be just like my mom when I get bigger, when I get older, right? when, I, when I get big enough 
Right? I, I, you know what I'm saying, right? Um, <laughs> but I want to be just like that. I want to I want to preach a sermon, right? I'll tell Rosemary, yeah, not for you. But um, <laughs> but um, that's what he wants for us, is that, that heart that I want to be just like that. Just as maybe some of us experience that, maybe some of us don't, right? Maybe some of us don't have a earthly father or mother who we really look up to and want to be like, right? But maybe some of us have experienced that. Have experienced like I, you know, I know I've had some conversations with some of you who you really love and respect your parents, and um, and just as you want to imitate them, wow, how much more do I want to imitate my heavenly? How much better of an example is he for me than my earthly father and mother? No matter how bad they are or how good they are, my heavenly father is such a better example for me. And look at all the ways that the scripture tells us that we are to be imitators of our heavenly father. Jesus says in Matthew 5.48, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect, right? Be complete. Seek to be complete in your ways, in your walk, in who you are, right? Be holy, for your God is holy, as Peter also says. Jesus also says in Luke 6, 36, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Paul says in Ephesians 4, verse 32, Be kind and tender-hearted to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Look at the example of our Heavenly Father. He is morally, totally perfect. And so we are imitating Him. We are seeking to be like Him in pursuing righteousness and justice and truth. Right? In loving kindness. We're being like him as he was merciful to us. We want to be merciful to others. As he forgave us, we want to be forgiving to others. Letting go of wrongs done to us. Because look at the example of my Heavenly Father. Man, if he could forgive me as he has forgiven me. And given me so many blessings to make it possible that I could become his child. How pathetic of me to withhold forgiveness from another person. How foolish of me. No, let me be like my Heavenly Father. And let me forgive. Let me be like Him in righteousness. Let me be like Him in purity. Let me be like Him in every way. Now, there's a lot there. They could probably preach a sermon just about that, right? Mm -hmm. I would call it to be like our Heavenly Father. But we don't have all that time, so we're going to move on. So, um, <clears throat> so what we see is we have a new identity. And we have a new model in our, in our flat family. And we have a new spirit. This is very much associated with our adoption in Christ, is that we have a new spirit. We're told in Scripture that this is one of the effects and the benefits of our adoption, is that the Holy Spirit bears witness with us that we are actually His children. He doesn't leave us wondering if we're His children, but He lives within us. And He testifies to the fact that we are His children. This is from Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Did you catch that? Everyone who is led by God's Spirit is a child of God. Everyone who walks by the Spirit, who lives their life by the Spirit of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons. By whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Hebrew word Abba means Daddy, Dad, Daddy, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. And that gets at another thing that's related to our adoption is how we have an inheritance, but we'll be talking about that in the future. So we won't be getting to that. But, uh, but just notice that, that he has given us a new spirit in this adoption, the Holy Spirit. 
And the Holy Spirit is there to reassure us of who we are in Christ, to testify to us of who we are in Christ, as well as to exhort us and rebuke us and correct us when we're not living like children of God and we're living like children of the world. He's there for us to testify, no, that's not who you are. You are a child of the Most High God. Live like it. Live worthy of the gospel. So we have so much uh, as children of God, adopted children of God. We have a new identity, a new model, a new spirit. And all this points to the truth that we have been totally embraced by the Father in Christ. Amen? We have been embraced and accepted. What a wonderful blessing that we have. So as we finish our time I just want to leave you with a couple questions to help you begin to apply this to yourself. To ask yourself, how can I respond to the word of God? What he is telling me today, how can I respond in obedience to him? Because that's how he wants us to respond. The scripture says, don't be like a man who looks in the mirror and forgets what he sees. And it doesn't change anything, right? But look at yourself through the perfect word of God and respond in obedience. So just two questions that... Um, that can vary depending on where you are. But the first question is, are you a child of God? Are you a child of God? Because we've been talking about this blessing of adoption, and Paul is talking to the Ephesians because he knows who they are. But the fact is, we could be sitting in this room, and we could still be experiencing what we talked about at the beginning of this message. We could still be strangers we can still be aliens to God's kingdom. We can still be outside of the household of God. Like that song that we said in the beginning, outside of the sheepfold of God. We can still be there. And we may still need to go through that adoption process to be brought in. Now, how can you know this? Well, have you received this free gift of God in Jesus Christ by faith? Have you received what he has promised? That you can have eternal life in Jesus Christ. That you can have forgiveness of sins. That you can be born again through the Holy Spirit. That you can be a child of God. Have you received it? Do you believe it? Not just believe it intellectually and say, yeah, that, that can be true. But did you say, yes, God, I'm, I receive it right now. I believe it. I want to take that for myself. I confess I've been a sinner. I've been your enemy. I've sinned against your holy law, your holy rule and reign. I confess it. Cleanse me now by the blood of your son and forgive me. Let me receive that total heart renewal. Make me new. Make me your son or your daughter. And he will take you in with open arms. As many as call upon the name of the Lord, they shall all be saved. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. He will not lead you out. You know, I think of, I've been reading Pilgrim's Progress, I think of the, this picture of um, Christian's wife, that's the main character, Christiana, a very original name. She goes to, this, to the door to knock on the door of salvation, right? Because of the scripture, anyone who knocks will be opened to him, right? And she knocks. And she knocks for a long time and she hears a dog, vicious dog barking. And she's with some friends here and they're all fr frightened. And they want to stop knocking for fear of the dog. But they say, no, it'd be, it's not even worth it. I'd rather be chewed up by this dog than to miss out on the blessing that is through this door, the door of salvation. Let me keep knocking until he opens. Now, when he opened, he only opened to Christiana and her children. And her friend Mercy was still left outside. Afraid that she had been rejected. And so she wails and knocks as hard as possible to be let in. And it pleases the eyes of the steward, who is the, supposed to be the symbol of Jesus. It pleases him just how much she knocks. And so he goes and opens the door for her. If you are not convinced that you are a child of God, that you have received the freedom of salvation, then knock. Keep knocking until you receive that assurance, until the Holy Spirit is given to you to testify to you that you are indeed a child of God. Knock, and he will open. Ask, and you shall receive. 
seek and you will find. So, consider that question, are you a child of God? And receive that promise that to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Second, if you are, the question is, are you living in the blessing of your adoption? Because even though we've been adopted into the very family of God, we can sometimes live like paupers. Uh, not P-O-P-P-E-R-S, but P-A-U-P-E-R-S. <laughs> By paupers, I mean, you know, just like poverty-struck people, right? Like as if our father wasn't the king of the universe, right? As if we weren't truly accepted by him, right? We can live like a prodigal son and think, you know, I have sinned. I've fallen into sin. God can't accept me. I'm just going to run away. I'm going to, maybe you ran away after sin for a while, right? Just like the prodigal son. And maybe you said, I've spent everything. I have nothing left. And you've been brought to humiliation. And you start thinking about, man, I wish I could go back to my father. And you say, but he would never accept me, though, would he? And so you just sit with the swine and the pigs, feeding the pigs, right? But then you think, man, it would be better to be a servant in his house than to be doing this. His servants are better taking care of me. I didn't even just accept to be a servant. Run back to the father. Run back to him. And seek for him to give you that assurance that you are a son. And what does he do for the prodigal son? He receives it with open arms. And, he, and, and the son starts saying, starts to try to work out a deal with him about how he can be a servant. And he doesn't even want to listen to him. He says, it's time to celebrate. I can barely speak anymore. I'm like joking. <laughs> um, <clears throat> that's what we need to run back to the father. Until we have the voice of the Spirit testifying within us, that we are a child of God, the voice that testifies with 1 John 3, verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. To have that faith, so I am. So we are. We so need that assurance because when fears are stirred in our life, when doubts come up, dread happens, right? Despair starts to sink in. All these things, it starts to shake up our identity in Christ. And how are we going to survive those moments? Well, it's as we remember this blessing that has been given to us in Christ. It's as we remember and recount the blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. It's as we sing out loud and praise and thank our God for the blessings that he has given us in Christ. That are ours in Christ. I have been adopted by the Father. The Father of mercies. I believe. He is my steadfast anchor. Christ is my hope. I have no other. All I have is Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you so thankful, Lord, for this blessing of adoption that we have. Lord, I, I pray for anybody in this room who is not convinced that they are a son or daughter of God. That maybe they ask that question, am I a child of God? And they say, I can't be, based off of what I've heard. I can't be, because... I haven't put my faith in Jesus Christ. I haven't received this free gift of God. Or maybe they just doubt it. I, I, I put my faith one time. I, I said some words. I said a prayer. But my experience has been totally different. I, I don't sense the presence and work of the Holy Spirit in my life testifying to me that I'm truly His child. I haven't heard anything. I feel so distant from God. Lord, for whoever that person is, whoever is out there feeling these thoughts, feeling these feelings, thinking these thoughts, would you just break in and give them faith to say, I receive the free gift of God in Jesus Christ. Let them pray with hearts of faith, I receive and I believe that you are truly that merciful God, that you will forgive me in Jesus Christ and my sin. You will cleanse me and make me your very own child and give me your Holy Spirit. I believe 
Now let me receive the truth and reality of this blessing. Lord, let it be for them. Let them receive this. Lord, for anybody out here who believes that they have been a child of God, that truly did have faith, and yet their experiences have driven them away from the full blessings of being your child. Lord, I pray that you would assure their hearts right now, that you would stir them to chase after you, to run to their heavenly Father, and run in faith, and to be embraced by you, and to experience what it truly means to be embraced and received by the Father of mercy. Lord, let it be, let our church be defined by this, that we live in our identity truly, that we are the children of God. Let that change everything about this church, Lord, as we embrace that truth. Let it change the way that we deal with our husbands, our wives, our children, our family, our parents, our extended family. Let it change the way we deal in our house. Let it change the way that we deal with our neighbors, in our community. Let us change the way we deal with our co-workers. Let us be a totally different person because we have received this truth that we are your children no matter where we are and that we can share in boldness so that others may receive this truth and that others may be adopted into your family. Yeah. Oh Lord, let many come to know you. Let many receive you because of this yeah. as a result of the seed that you're putting in us this morning through your word. Let it bear so much fruit for your glory as you multiply your word in us. And we pray, Lord, for all this. In the name and power of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. So as we continue our time of worship, we go to our time of the Lord's Supper, communion. And this is such a beautiful picture. It's such a, I, I love doing communion every week because it's yeah. it's never irrelevant. The gospel is never irrelevant. And the picture of Christ on the cross, the picture of his blood given for us, his body broken for our healing, it's never irrelevant. We need it every day, let alone every week. Um, and so I just want you to approach the table. Uh, the elements are in the back on this table here. You can take those, go back to your seats, take time to meditate on the body and blood of Christ to recount to the Lord what you have maybe, what the Lord has been stirring in your heart, right? Just to talk with him, engage with him, whatever it is, um, and to apply the blood of Christ to yourself. Um, and so let that be a time for you meditating. If you have not put your faith in Christ, then I ask you to refrain until you have done so. I mean, you can do that in your seat right now and take your first communion, but this is a symbol Right? It's more than a symbol, but at the very least, it's a symbol of what we have received in Christ, his body and blood. Um, and so only partake if you have, are a child of God, have believed in, in Jesus Christ. Um, but yeah, so we'll, we'll go to our seats, we'll take a time of meditation, and then we'll partake together. Okay? So let's do that right now. 